Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akio, and if you're interested in design and development collaboration, this episode is for you. We share what is expected of design nowadays, how to grow the fastest you can, as well as some experiences when it comes to collaboration and how to do that more effectively. Joining me today is Jonathan Zier, gamer, dad, and product design director, and I love learning from his experiences. Enjoy. I'm really curious as to what your experience is working in a product team, because Mm -hmm. most of the product teams I've worked with only have one designer, whereas then with a bigger development team, I feel like the design is kind of the funnel for the work that needs to be done, as well from a visual perspective, as well as kind of design and market research perspective, right? You mentioned A-B testing as kind of testing your outcome and testing your assumptions, but still we want to do enough research to make sure we're actually building kind of the right thing. Yeah. before we then test and optimize that, which is a whole lot of work, I feel like. Have you worked with product teams where you were the only designer or have you worked yeah, with a design course. team as well? Um, so I, I worked in all uh, setups. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I also, when you talk about, you know, agile and the waterfall and all this stuff and fake agile, <laughs> that's also a thing. Waterfall, the agile. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, there's there's a few different setups. Mm. There's like the really tight tight team, yeah, and that's usually like one or two designers working with uh, front end, back end, security, DevOps. You know, depends on the um, on the project or the if you work for a client, depends on the client. And then you're really tight. Mm. So I think you you also talked to Michael Dewey, my also <laughs> previous colleague. Yeah, um, so we work together in a. Um, in this kind of product team and we were really really super tight we had really short time frames it was an innovation project so there was no exist there was nothing yeah you have to build everything from scratch and this is where you have to really collaborate closely and uh, we did things like uh, they have design pairing when we sit next to each other and instead of me designing something fancy on my figma and saying you know hey fancy front ender make it happen we just said okay this is the general concept let's sit together and figure it out mm. and then like yeah i can do this i cannot do this so how do we compromise this and this wasn't really nice exercise of finding the balance between feasibility and, and experience yeah so this is a really tight team pro- like tight product team example mm. that I, I also f- you know sit down with the uh, back end there understand what are, what is the information he's getting uh, what kind of apis does he have and and trying to see okay how do I use it in the design? So it's actually the other way around. This yeah. is the information we have. We had this kind of financially heavy uh, solution and I needed to understand what are all the figures we can actually show and how do we arrange them and what makes sense for the user. Mm. So that means I need to really know what we can and cannot you know, get. Yeah. So I can make, again, my fancy design, come back and say, make it. But this was more like a tight collaboration. Mm. So this is, of course what I prefer, right? This is the, I see it as an ideal situation, but sometimes the, uh, again, going back to the scale, the big uh, solutions, uh, you find yourself in a corporate Mm. uh, setup. So there's a bit more separation. So there's a design team Mm. and there's a development team. Yeah. And um, this is, this is, again, you have this same conversations but there is a lot more of siloing of the designers kind of work with the brand guides and uh, with the vision and making something they think from experience and visual perspective is ideal. Mm. And then you say, okay, let's start a conversation. Let's bring in uh, the development team and discuss and see, okay, is this even possible? What is the effort? Uh, And then we are starting this negotiation of, okay, if we make this, it will take us three sprints. Is it worth it? And this is, a, again, the, the, the sad part of being a designer that you have to compromise a lot for mm. feasibility. But um, yeah, so that's, that's another setup when basically you have two separate teams. I'm trying to think if there's another one. There is also um, kind of an overlapping one. So you have product teams. So mm. again, big, big uh, solution. Uh, for example, in the e-commerce side, you have different product teams that they own different parts of the journey, of the user journey. Yeah. Some of them own the uh, checkout, some the you know PDP, some the uh, whatever the more exploration part in the beginning. And what you have is that you get a bit of both. So the um, the product team operates 
uh, quite tightly. Mm. So you collaborate a lot, like I mentioned before. But there's also like this uh, overlapping circles between the b- different teams because everybody owns a part of the journey. You cannot work in a silo. You have to understand what happened to the user before he came to your part of the journey. Yeah. And when you're designing something that impacts the rest of the journey, you also need to talk to the other teams. Mm. So uh, in that way, you get like this uh, overlap. So uh, the designers are really talking to each other, but you also in your own product team, really tight with the uh, with your own you know, team members and mm. working nitty gritty into the details. Yeah. So, yeah. But still, there's, there's a lot of magic when you have uh, early stage, tight team trying to figure out things, almost like a startup uh, vibe to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if I look back at my own kind of experiences, I've only had the, let's say the, the product team, the one that you're most fond of, that, mm. that's been my most experience. Okay. I've only had once where there was actually a design agency. And since I worked at a consultancy, that was also a different company as a whole which was then feeding our team with fancy designs mm. in a way that we had to have those discussions of feasibility and then duration as well when it comes to time and investment, which was very hard to work with. So then I always got the preference of, okay, having people in the team to then work yeah. together with and have those discussions. And I think compromise from both ends because engineers also love some engineers over-engineering a solution and making it perfect from an engineering perspective. And I think compromising and, and having some middle ground on both ends as well as come from kind of a business value creation standpoint, um, is the best solution. Even though it's it's hard to do that yeah. and to, to make that happen in that way. And and when you work with the agency, basically, at what phase were you involved? Is it just they finalized the designs and just threw it over the fence and said, "What do you think?" Mm. Or was it there like a process where they like stage gates? What yeah, we kinda- we knew what was coming functionally, but then they were very much involved in how to do that visually. And we were then Im- involved more so at the end when they already imagined mm. and mostly created almost all the designs. And that was the hard part because then we had to be like, okay, you get something. And from a development point of view, you're like, okay, either you see holes and you, then you have to shoot and be like, how does this work? And yeah. they're like, okay, we haven't thought of that. So that back and forth would take the longest or you would be like, well, I had something way simpler in my mind. And then you have that discussion of, okay, wh- where are you going to go here? Are you going to go towards the end solution or something in the middle? And then product will have to jump in between as well and make a decision at the end. Yeah. yeah. And I think something people forget is that we are all also users, mm-hmm. right? We are also, we are also consumers of our own product. And uh, something that I liked when it happened in, in, in either on clients or uh, in a product team is that you come much earlier with your concept mm. And you get everybody in the team, regardless of their, um, you know, their role, yeah. to poke at it. Mm. And it can be from your own perspective. If you're a front ender, you would say, "Yeah, this is going to be difficult to make." If you're like, uh, if you're saying, "Okay, this is going to be hard to cash in," <laughs> like there's a lot of information in this table. This is practical things. But also, I love it when, like, the security engineer says, "Like, yeah, I don't get this. Mm. It's not clear. Yeah, uh, maybe consider doing it differently." Because, because that's super valuable. And if I um, if I just say yeah no he doesn't know anything about design I would lose a lot of insight yeah so again I'm I'm not a big fan of the agency working in the dark coming in throwing in designs I really like the product team like mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, but there's also ways of introducing it into your process that you're getting the whole team on board with your designs yeah because sometimes maybe there's a, logic to to all the designs that they made mm. but you were not there you, you don't you didn't get the whole process of how did they come up with this yeah so you're just judging the final outcome absolutely and yeah of course of course maybe there's smart people that made great choices but you're kind of like hey, i don't get it no so, that's the that's the worst part uh, or the worst situation and, to be in and you're not really empowered in that sense you, you're just like uh uh, how you call it? Like del- you're just on the delivery side. Just yeah, make yeah. it, yeah. and that's that's not fun to anybody. No, that's uh, I agree with that. There's yeah. a thing you mentioned about feedback, which I think is interesting because I have the same challenge from a product perspective. Whenever we deliver a feature, whenever we deliver value, we get feedback from the users. Sometimes very direct, sometimes indirect, mm-hmm. depending on the the size of the organization. But there is always feedback, and especially if you're building an internal tool for an organization, and those users are right next to you everyone expects their feedback to also be picked up. And I Mm. feel like from a design perspective, 
it's kind of the same, right? You you create something, you get feedback, but I feel like it's very hard to balance accommodating for the feedback as well as kind of believing in your own vision and being like, no, this is for these reasons. Therefore, the feedback we're not going to incorporate in that way. Yeah. Um, and, and this is again when you compromise, mm. right? Because, um, well, if we had data about everything, yeah. <laughs> that It'll would be easy. easy. <laughs> like I, I just did a... Um, a redesign for, for, for a journey. Yeah. And it was amazing because we had so much data about behavior and so much insight about, you know, where users are coming from. And we had both uh, direct uh, uh, feedback from users, like what we call um, qualitative uh, um, data. data. And we also had quantitative. So we also saw yeah, what converts better, where do we funnel and, and et cetera. And what it made is that um, basically when you design at the end, almost all your decisions are based or backed up by something. And this is really, and this is really a unique uh, snowflake kind of situation because many times there's a lot of holes. Yeah. Also in this case, there were holes, but on, on the bigger topics, there were quite a lot of things to support you in your decisions. Mm. So when somebody comes to you and say, you know, somebody from the, um, from your own team saying like, yeah, I don't like this mm -hmm. or yeah, I think we should do this. Yeah. Then you can have the conversation and say, okay, but we have data supporting this kind of approach. Um, even doing benchmark, you know, looking at 10 other journeys that are exactly the same. You, you can always say they are all wrong, mm. right? But it got, does give you a sense of saying, Yeah, if we do this, this is really different from what users are, are used to. Yeah, there's there's more risk there. So this this is where where I like it. I never say no to any feedback, and always try to understand the the, the underlining issue that the person has. Right. So mm. maybe you you finish something and you're quite confident in it, and somebody comes with like a feedback out of nowhere, and but it's yeah, it's always good to just try to understand, ask why, 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 and realize, okay, they actually have an issue with something else or they didn't understand or they don't have the full picture. Yeah. So, yeah, but it, it, it is quite rare. Like always we, we have a lot of assumptions in what we do. And even when we validate, even when we go in and do, uh, you know, interviews or even try to collect, um, you know, track user behavior, mm -hmm. there's always interpretation. Yeah and bias and et cetera. So it's never perfect, but um, that's why we still have a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's never perfect. So, you know, yeah. we need I, to improve I, it. I really like that you say the, the data wins, right? At the end of the day, whether that's market research before, and then based on that, you foundationalize your assumptions or you A-B test and you figure out, okay, this decision actually, even though everyone think, thought it wasn't going to work, it actually made the most sense yeah. out of the data. Yeah. Then you have to make those decisions. And at the end of the day, It is easier the more data you have, I feel like. Yeah, but, but there's still human decision at the end. Yeah. So even if the data said, okay, we should really go for whatever, make the font huge, right? <laughs> we, yeah. we all love that. Can you make it bigger? So yeah, data showed that this makes all the users notice this. Yeah. But then you're really isolated on one thing because mm -hmm. once you made all your, all your users or customers, users is a tricky word, we, will, we can discuss it later. Um, all your humans, <laughs> they notice just that big title. Yeah. They forget about other stuff. So they're being diverted from other journeys or other things they're trying to do. So even with data, you can say it's, it's always, always wins, mm. but it's also how do you, in what context you put it in. And this is the interesting part. And this is where as a, a user experience designer, you can really bring that overview of kind of challenging and saying, yes, we have the data. Yes, we have your opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes, we kind of know what the user is trying to do, but uh, let's let's look at the bigger picture. Let's yeah. analyze it a bit deeper. And yeah, and at the end, you always have a stakeholder that comes in and say like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just want it this way. And that's also legit. Like, yeah, uh, I feel like that is the art because you, from a decision-making standpoint, whether that's UX product, even development, you want as much feedback as you can, right? From yep. people as well as yep. data, yet you still want that decision power with yourself. And at the end of the day, you want to make a decision, but still don't break any relationships because otherwise you lose that feedback. You might lose that stakeholder. And the more people are, that are in your corner, the better it is, I think, for the product and what you're creating basically with yeah. your business. So it's very hard to accommodate for feedback, have people feel acknowledged, 
even though you're saying no in a way. And I love that you're saying, I never say directly no. I try and understand where the feedback is coming from because in that way, you might still give that sense of fulfillment to someone while still di disagreeing with their feedback or doing something else based on other facts, basically. Yeah, yeah I, sometimes I wonder if we spend more time convincing each other mm. than actually doing the job. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, I guess that's part of the process and what makes good product and what makes a team work well. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you kind of like, it's really obvious. And when I say obvious, it's like based on experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's obvious this is what we should do. Yeah. But then you have to convince a lot of people and you spend a lot of time not figuring out the solution, mm. but just getting the buy-in on that solution. Yeah. And that, that can be a bit, again, going back to the frustration part of, yeah, why, why do we have to go through all these loops to get it happen? But, but the buy-in is super important mm -hmm. because uh, when something goes goes in the funnel, like when it's, um, when you decided this is the direction, this is the solution, there's a lot of impact. So people are going to start working on it. It's going to be, you know, published. It's going to be live. Users are going to see it, interact with it. It's going to have business impact. So, so yeah, you, sometimes you forget, like maybe I'm just moving here two pixels, but there's so much like a um, like snowball cascading. effect. Yeah. And, and something nice we had in the past is that we said, okay, as designers, our job is to make sure that when, um, our solution comes in the hands of developers. We did all we can mm. to ensure this is the, the, the lowest risk uh, effort you, you can do. So basically we did all we can to validate that this is a right, good idea. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is now going in and looking at the designs and trying to implement them and trying to build that uh, uh, solution, yeah, they are confident that they're not just <laughs> wasting their time and that's going to be thrown out of the window mm. in two seconds. And, and I, I like to put that in the back of my head when I, when I go into a design process, yeah. that I, I have responsibility to make sure that, you know, people working on this, they have the confidence that they're not wasting their lives for some, <laughs> some like a whim, you know, some uh, designer's whim uh, of, yeah, we should do this. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I, I agree with that, but also to play devil's advocate, there's kind of a right time, right place for that. Mm -hmm. When you're at an early stage and all the features matter basically because time is at the utmost importance, then I think that holds true. But when we're looking at kind of a further stage in a product where you're working more towards multiple scenarios and you're, you really want to test in production mm -hmm. what works best, I love doing something and then being like, okay, is this actually going to matter or not from a development standpoint? And then I have no problem throwing it away if it doesn't work. Yeah, We had this kind of optimization in a checkout and we had the assumption together with design that, okay, from a checkout form perspective, we can make it easier for people to see what data they need to fill in. So we added colors. And I was like, okay, at, as a guy, like there's a male percentage, 10% of males have like an issue with colors. It's like a color deficiency, basically, they call it. So yeah, I'm partially colorblind. So I was like, this is not going to work for me. How about we also do shapes? Give me a check or give me an X or whatever. So we incorporated that as well. And then we all of a sudden had three variants, the existing, the new with the colors, and the one uh, with the icons. And all of a sudden the ones with the icons made the most sense out of the data. And I was like, okay, I have no problem removing all the color stuff, even though we built it, I built it as fast as possible to see if it would work basically with that in mind. And then the work that you create, even if you do just a regular A-B test and your new feature doesn't actually make any difference, then I do think we should throw that away because the simpler we have our application, mm. Also from a tech perspective and more code, code is like a weight. The less code we have, the lighter we are, the faster we can go. Yeah. Well, what you're talking about is kind of like fail, fail fast, mm. right? And, and what I'm trying to say is that it's easier sometimes for, for designers to fail fast mm. than for developers because there's more loops you need to go through yeah. to make things you know, live. And for me to make a prototype, I can do it in 30 minutes make a really extensive prototype and just go and see if it works or not. Yeah. So there is also that in, in the mix. And if, if designers tell you like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to waste time on it, but that's, that's our job like to do. So yeah, this is a small example, the icon, mm. but when you go in like bigger feature or a bigger change, yeah. then that's going to be a lot of effort for you to make it, to make it live. Right. Very true. Yeah. And, and for me it will be, quite fast. <laughs> so yeah. it's like unfair how fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but it's not it's not the real thing, right? Yeah. There's there is a lot of tools now to make it uh, to fake it <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. But it's different. But I, I I of course everybody in their own lane should try 
to experiment and 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 basically evolve their products uh, as much as they can. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you are getting caught in all this process and all this, you know, everything needs to be uh, evaluated. You know, we need to refine it before we actually go forward. And you kind of feel like, okay, I just, yeah, I don't have the opportunity to just experiment and try things and just throw it into the wild and see what happens. Yeah. But yeah, that's, um, uh, again, depends on the culture that you're working in. Absolutely. And how much you empower people in the, in the team to do these kind of things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of kind of the, the skill set nowadays of, first of all, developers, which are quite broad. Yep. You have front and back end data engineering, more so AI, especially nowadays, which is mm-hmm. kind of more booming. But from a design perspective, it's, it's super broad as well, I've realized. And I don't think many people <laughs> realize how broad it could be, yet we might sometimes expect the world out of, yeah. in a product team, it could be one designer. From a research perspective, from prototyping to actually visual design and then market research and user feedback at the end, like all of those could be a separate job in and of its own. Yeah. Exactly. Sometimes it's only in one person and they, first of all, have a preference. They, second of all, have experience of what they're good at. And then third of all, probably want to learn a lot of what they might not be good at or be really go deep in what they're already good at and make that even better. Do you feel like it's, it's too much right now? Cause I've, and it's funny. I heard that recently. <laughs> I've heard the term full stack designer. Yeah. Like, what is that? Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Terminology in the design world is a, is a, <laughs> it's a topic. If I start talking about it, it would never stop. And also I only have my opinion and it's really funny, but yeah, I call myself a product designer, mm-hmm. right? If I go now to a company like Philips, a product designer is somebody making physical products. Yeah. So it's already I'm off. You know? <laughs> I now work for uh, uh, an automotive uh, company. And when I say product, they only mean one product, the car. Mm. So... So that's just one example that it's also broader than just the design um, industry. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, trends. And yeah, you, you have the full stack designer, the unicorn designer, mm. the uh, I can do it all. And if we're being honest, there's always, for every designer, there's a strong side and, and areas that they need to either get support or they are looking into doing more. Yeah. And this is the nice, I think the nice thing about it is that when it's not that harshly defined, there's more chance for you to kind of explore these other avenues. Mm. So if, if I call uh, if I call myself a UX designer, right, user experience, then it means that um, either I do really early stage discovery and research, or like before we go into uh, visual design, wireframing and flow, you know, flow charting and all this kind of stuff. But that kind of gives me a limitation, yeah. But you see, even in, in a UX designer, there's like a broad sense. Yeah, and you're really scientific about it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like, yeah, there's people that are really, really research heavy, and there are people that are still kind of close, more closer to UI designers, to user interface designers, in the sense of they want to make stuff, they want to, they want to try it out, they want to play with it. They can even do a product from zero to to a hundred. Mm. So I I have so many opinions about titles. And I think it's always about the person and how they frame their own expertise. Mm. Um, in a product team, I, I would say, like the, my current setup is basically I'm a, I'm a UX designer, but I also do UI work. And I have a whole uh, research team mm. support me because it's a lot to also run the research yourself yeah. and do the interviews, write, write the scripts, all of that stuff. So I, I feel like it depends on the scale of the solution and the scale of the product. Mm. You got to have support. And um, yeah, maybe you, you really want to learn about running uh, interviews. So if you have a, a researcher with you, which is another type of, uh, I don't know, designer, <laughs> um, you can join them and, you know, take notes and learn and, and et cetera. But you, you got to have, you, you cannot have everything on your back. No. For, for for bigger projects. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't know how you experienced it with your designers. And uh, many times when a designer tries to do a bit of everything, yeah, so- something falls. So we cannot be good at everything. No. Um, even a full stack developer cannot be good at- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? I, know, I know that. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Um, but it, it is, it is, it's an interesting topic in the industry and uh, it went through a lot. Yeah, you had in the past uh, GUI, 
designers and web designers and mobile designers and like why is it just limited to one <laughs> platform different? yeah yeah so um yeah I, I like to call myself a product designer because it's kind of fluffy enough to give me a chance to do a bit of everything yeah I think um, so too yeah I mean from a product team I kind of know what a product designer would do or can do yeah I mean especially now from a product manager perspective I like asking people what what they want to do because I feel like want is a big thing if you mm -hmm. want to do something you have you I mean, first of all, a passion, a certain drive for it. And I can enable you to do that from a product management perspective. I can see opportunities and put people in the right places to do so. Then I also try and learn kind of what their experience is, so what, they, what they've already done in the past, what they might be good mm. at in that way. And I try and accommodate and leverage that to whatever we need to do. And if I see there's holes in there, then it becomes, those are kind of the challenges we need to overcome. So yeah. also for design, right now we have a very, large i would say development team um which needs to be needs to be fed with basically work uh and the organization is more and more i feel like more organizations i work with which are software heavy really rely on market research and design yeah. and are very design driven first of all i think that's a really good thing right we we cannot just exactly as you said the time investment to create software if it's the wrong thing is a big investment so we try and do enough research to make sure we're building the right thing And then still we can experiment and see how to tweak it. But at mm -hmm. least we know everything is feasible, right? We do our best to do so. Then it becomes a bottleneck if you have only one person kind of feeding the development team in that. And then there's still a preference of, let's say I have a person that loves to do more so the research perspective and their balance in what is feasible is different or their appetite for what is feasible is different than from either the business or the development team. Mm -hmm. And then we have to manage that. I feel like that is... Uh, That might be the current situation I'm in. Whereas the bigger team you have, the more work kind of needs to be there because more work can be created. So then the funnel basically, which is the design team, that gets smaller and smaller and more narrow in that yeah. way. Yeah, this is actually a rare occasion that mm. the uh, designer is behind development. Like usually the designer is like quite fast to create a lot of concepts or a lot of ideas. Yeah. And then that's being fed quite, you know, a lot so you're in a luxury <laughs> or that designer maybe he feels the pressure but um, he or she feels the pressure but uh, yeah it, it, at least there is the, the, the firepower to uh, make it happen yeah yeah but I do recognize what you're saying and you always have to decide where's your focus are we early stage we need to learn more about what we're building are we kind of like in the middle is it about like what is the critical features that we need to add or is it again the more later stage of really small increments of, of refinements. And each one of them has their own challenge and, and kind of different slices of the pie yeah. of the time you need to invest. But um, yeah, it's always, it's always better to work with more of your kind around you. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we are. We're stronger as a, as a, as a tribe. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and the same for designers. Like it's, it's, I found it really hard to be a, uh, solo designer mm. and just work in isolation. But Even how, if, how often has that happened? Because I feel like that happens more often than it should. Um, wow, it's, it depends. But yeah, in, it, it happened in, in, in my career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I always found ways to, to bring other designers closer mm. and collect feedback and et cetera. So even, you know, we work as part of a company. So if, if you're an agency or if you're a consultancy, Yes, maybe you find yourself in a product team alone, but then there's other product teams in different clients or different areas of the organization. Yeah. So you do need to find your, your uh, uh, yeah, counterparts. Kind of like, who can I ask feedback from? Mm. I, I cannot design more than two hours without getting somebody else to look at it. Mm. I, I feel weird. It mm. kind of feels like, well, what am I doing here? I'm just, you know, like a cow eating their own. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, So yeah, so I always call in somebody, I, even talking to somebody, like not giving them, they don't really need to give you like the most crazy in, um, feedback or insights, but you just need that collaboration. So when, you, when you're finding yourself isolated, there are ways to reach out to others. Now, what you refer to is actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you're alone doing the work, then it's also a lot of prioritizing. Yeah. And uh, what worked for me, is that I know there are things that are low risk. Mm. So like core features or things that, you know, by doing quick benchmark, just looking at the competition, 
I know all of them have that feature. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna reduce, I'm not gonna invest time in researching that. There's low risk, I don't need to validate, I will just make that. Mm. Then that goes to the development team. <laughs> they, have, they have enough to run with. And then I can really take the risky uh, areas of the product and explore them. Yeah. Or the more innovative um, things. And, and that's also a way to mitigate that uh, time management. Mm. But you always start by, okay, this is a low hanging fruit, let's just get this done. Yeah. And then I don't have the pressure of time yeah, figuring out <laughs> what to do. <laughs> Yeah, because research takes so much time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know how, how, how many people know, but just getting... So first of all, you need to write the yeah um, kind of definition of who you want to interview, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the um, qualitative in this case. So you need to explain exactly who you want to interview, right? Define your, your persona or define your target audience. Then you need to somehow find those people, yeah. right? And then you need to book their time. People are busy. They don't have like, so no. it's, if you're, if you're, if you want to get like eight people to talk to, it's going to take you two weeks to get, just schedule them. Yeah. And then you need to write the script of what are you actually want to ask them, you know, and you need that to be refined a few times because when you write it first time, it's super biased. Mm. <laughs> you just ask, like, do you like this feature? Yeah. I really like because this feature. This do I you like, like this feature? <laughs> Um, so you, you also need to have some time to process your own questions. Yeah. Yeah. And then if it's also, there's like a visual materials, there's a prototype or you're using a current website or you're using a current existing app, mm. you need to prepare that as well. So that needs to be in place. And then the really annoying thing is that when you're done with a whole interview, you have all these great insights. They are all stuck in a table somewhere. You need to actually distill them. You know, you need to actually summarize them and make them um, visible to others. Mm. Like if you did a research and everything is stuck in your head, that's useless. Yeah. Next time somebody else comes in, they don't have the record. And that also takes time. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was just my way of saying, yeah, research takes time. And um, sometimes you f you, you're kind of finding yourself at the end. Okay, a, cl a classic thing is that um, a stakeholder says like, yeah, we should do this. And you're like, okay, we need to validate it. It's like, no, this is obvious. We should just do this. Mm. You're like, okay, but let's, let's run a test. It's like, okay, fine. And then you've done the whole test, the whole thing I just talked about, right? These two weeks of waiting, these two weeks of processing. And after a month, you come back and you said, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you're right back, the whole I told time. You like, so. <laughs> so why did we do the test? You yeah. know, why did we interview all these people? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's risk versus reward, I feel like. And I'm, I'm really curious in this kind of suite of, let's say, creating a product, from a design perspective, as well as from a software perspective. When do you involve then software engineers? Because you said you already like that kind of dev development pairing session, for yep. example. But I feel like, I'm also biased, I feel like if I were to be at the research side, I would also gain valuable insights of in course. understanding whatever we're doing here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side on this. Mm. Um, again, in, in more tight teams, uh, I had... Uh, the whole team members, they can join the interviews uh, basically as a note taker. Yep. So they're in the background, they're not visible to the, uh, to the um, interviewee. Mm -hmm. um, and they can also ask questions like, hey, he just said this weird thing. Can you ask him? And I'm, I'm getting a text message of like saying, okay, this is an interesting question from my front ender. Let me ask that. Yeah. And it really gets them in the mindset of what we're trying to do. Mm. So even when they are now, we are discussing a new feature, they say, oh yeah, I remember when we interviewed David, um, you know, he said that. So this is really critical, but I actually think he meant that he wants this feature. So can we tweak it? So you're getting all that cycle and this is perfect. But it's, it's again, it's about of um, time investment and uh, return on that. So yeah. your, your team members can write code or they can sit and listen to somebody brabble about uh, a feature. Yeah. So it depends how stressed you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, talking to you as a product manager. Yeah, now. yeah. No, I was thinking like, <laughs> I I don't want to choose four people. Yeah, it's it's really hard if I don't choose four people. And everyone all of a sudden decides we're going to do four hours of interviews. Yeah. Then yeah, th we don't have much time in the in the day left, basically. Yeah. But There's also the hard recordings, part. right? So yeah. you can also look at recordings afterwards, or that uh, you make sure the designer uh, kind of present the results and collect questions. Mm -hmm. Or even even from the script uh, phase. So before you go into the interviews, 
you kind of present to your team, this is the questions I'm going to ask. Yeah. Is there anything else you guys want to you know, ask about? Yeah. That can also be a way to kind of get people involved. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, in general, the closer you are, the better it is. It's like, a, yeah, there's no way around it. Huh? I, I mean, I fully agree. It's just, yeah, from that product side, it's really hard because I feel like everything is like risk versus reward and trust. Because if, mm. I, if I do enable people, I trust them to do their best and stuff like that. And everyone has trust by default. So then it's just a risk versus reward. How much do we get based on this, based on X amount of people joining extra? And right now we're very much, okay, the team is completely new. It's also a bigger team. Everyone's getting used to everything. So I feel like we need time, basically. We, can, we, can, we need as much time as we can get yeah. also to understand what we're doing. Because this investment right now, especially when a team has just formed, way of working, creating value is going to return in the future as long as the team remains stable. That's the big asterisk yeah. there. So then I'm trying to give everyone as much time as they can, also when the domain is most complex, to figure that out. And then, yeah, I feel like I'm just postponing those risk versus reward decisions for <laughs> later on. At some point, I feel like, okay, we, we, do, we will need to deliver. Yeah. But right now, we're still uh, in uh, a very fresh domain. I really like it. And, and I think a lot of product managers or team leads are underestimating the, the bonding or kind of like the investment in the culture of a, of a team. Yeah. Uh, before they go and they start like <laughs> crunch time. Because mm -hmm. if, you know, if the team does not trust the, the designer that they're doing like the best job they can or that they appreciate their effort, so they, they think about what they uh, follow through, you're going to get a lot of friction. Mm -hmm. And the same when um, the, the designer thinks like, okay, just the founders are just lazy. They don't want to do it. It's a lot of effort. I want these fancy micro animations. <laughs> Why are they like shooting those down? Um, then you are getting like this conflict and then people will try less and it will be less productive. So um, yeah, getting that tight team feeling is, is super important. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also a bit of luck. So mm -hmm. um, it's like magic. Yeah. Yeah. You just need to get the right people in the right um, mindset. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do it. I, uh, I did have one kind of final train of thought because I thought this was interesting from a product perspective. I recently had a guest on, or kind of recently, Bandon, and he said, from a product perspective, he's always been in this payment domain mm -hmm. because it's just interesting. And he's gone from country to country, so he's seen various stages of payments being available to people. And I think about myself from a development perspective, right now, most experience I have has been in e-commerce, but I do not want to do more e-commerce. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of fed up with it. I want to do other stuff. Yeah. And I feel like from a design perspective, you, you have these tracks where you can go really deep into the same domain and still go from either country to country, company to company and see various stages of that. Take all the domain knowledge with you and leverage that in whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. Or like kind of my developer experience, be like, okay, I've seen that. I want to go to the automotive industry and yeah. figure that out. Or I want to do e-commerce or I want to do whatever. On which um, track are you? Uh, before I say which track am, am I, I will contradict you and say, I think designers are exactly the same. They don't mm -hmm. want to stay in their, you know, in their domain for a long time. Yeah. We, we like to specialize, but then it's also really nice to change industry or change like a whole different, you know, if, you, if you're working on apps for five years, it's not that you want to just keep on doing that. Or I love it when job description says um, e-commerce experience or banking experience or like, yeah, if somebody worked in banking for eight years, they don't want to do banking anymore. <laughs> like that's the whole point. But they're really good at it. Of course they're really good yeah. at it, but they had enough of it and that's that's the same. So I, I think in general, um, you like to take your superpowers mm. and use them on different planets. I don't know if that's a, a good metaphor. But, I love it. But basically you want to be challenged and become a, a subject matter expert in a different field. It's like, uh, yeah, I did, uh, I did banking for four years, right? I said like, okay, no more. Mm. I became really good at all this stuff, like, you know, understanding all the different uh, uh, tools that you use and already have, okay, what do you need? You need a payment? Fine, I know exactly the journey. I've seen it. I did benchmark for a hundred times, but you don't want to do it anymore. Mm. And I, I think the same with like e-commerce. E-commerce is a bit more fluffy because you can find yourself doing e-commerce for different products yeah. and- you know, selling selling cars is really different than selling things like that cost one dollar on uh, Alibaba, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so there is a different challenge. But um, yeah, I think we're all trying to kind of 
be challenged constantly and make it interesting. So mm. I don't think there's, a, I, I would like to specialize in a, in a field. There's maybe things that you find more interesting, but I will give you an, a really quick example. Um, I had a project about a process of auditing products. Okay. okay. So it's, it was a really weird thing. It's basically uh, the whole process of when something is manufactured, let's say you, you wear a t-shirt, that t-shirt is a uh, Nike t-shirt, no sponsorship. <laughs> um, and basically that is being made in a factory. Then that's been packed, it's been shipped, it's been um, whatever, uh, distributed to shops and then a client buys it. There's a company that checks the quality of the product in every step of the way. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And basically I came into that having no knowledge about this whole process, right? And I've been asked to map this entire journey, like mm. this entire service and, and basically find the areas we can optimize. Yeah. And again, I don't know anything. <laughs> And the first day I'm getting like all these abbreviations and terminology and I don't know anything, but that's exciting because you're getting to learn something. And this is like a whole different weird thing. Mm. I didn't know like somebody actually from a company goes into H&M and buy a shirt and takes it to a lab and test that this is the same shirt that they tested in the, in the factory. That's, that's crazy. Insane. Yeah. yeah. So this might sound like the most boring project <laughs> ever, but actually doing it was kind of cool, you know? It was kind of like, whoa, this is a whole different industry I never knew existed. Yeah. So um, this is what I think really nice about our field is that we are kind of agnostic and we can find ourselves in different um, cl clients, products, platforms, everything. And that's really cool. So I think I kind of answered your, your yeah. question. Yeah, I think so really too. Lengthy way. No, it's... <laughs> I, I mean, I'm biased, right? I, I agree with that, that the domain for me is most interesting. I do, however, see that, like this ambiguity, you have to kind of yeah, be comfortable in it, right? You have yeah. to have that curiosity drive you. Any other person could have been like, what the hell's going on with these abbreviations? Like, I, I don't want to do this, basically. And they run away and they go to something they're more comfortable at or something they've done before. And they do the whole process, for example, at Nike, Adidas, or any other clothing store. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same process, basically. They'll be like, oh, how does it work here? And oh, it's still kind of the same, maybe some slight differences. So yeah. Full respect. Like if, if this is your thing, then- It's, it's whatever floats it, your again, boat. Again, ex exactly. Yeah. And I don't think there's a right or wrong. I just really don't see the other side yet. <laughs> from a product perspective, I do get it. And actually from every perspective, because you're so valuable for, for an organization. Yeah. And- with your e-commerce example, from a development perspective, I'm like, okay, Alibaba or like selling one product or millions of products might be kind of slightly different or get more complex, but it's still kind of the same. Like you have a basket, you check out. From a design perspective, it might still be kind of the same and, and different. But yeah, yeah, from a product perspective, you do know what to focus on then, I guess. It's, uh, it's yeah, a balance. It's so different. Like I... I worked for a, a glasses mm. a company, eyewear, yeah. and I work for an automotive company, right? They both have a configurator. Mm. You can configure your product. Configuring your, your glasses, right? Like you would get to, you went wild, <laughs> 200 euros, you know? Yeah. Configuring your car, you know, that's, uh, that's yeah, a yeah. different aspect. And you use the configurator in such a different way. Mm. And the functionality is so different. And the kind of reinsurances or in, not reinsurance, insurances, that you need to have when you go into that process, they are so different. Yeah. Um, and, and even your goal is so different. So it might be like they're both e-commerce, right? You're just configuring your, your product. But the, the, the journey that gets the user into that configurator is so different. Mm. And the, the amount of times they go into that configurator, you know, when you, when you buy in a car, you will go probably five times and try different things. And, and you know, your journey is so much big, bigger. When you're getting like your iPhone cover, you, you will basically go <laughs> <That's it. laughs> two or three times. Yeah, just, uh, you know, I'll just get the cheapest or the one that looks the best. Yeah. So it, if, even within like things that might be using the same functionality, yeah, there's, there's the, this ch challenge of, of having that uh, bigger journey in mind. Mm. So I, f I find this really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that as well. That's kind of a like final, final thought then. <laughs> from, from your experience kind of looking back, there's various 
avenues, right? You have consultancies, agencies, either internal at an organization, and then different domains as well. Would you say there's like a specific place or a specific track where designers can grow the fastest or, or really get to experience the most in kind of their learning journey in that way? Yeah, it's an easy, easy answer in all of them. Like mm. you should really jump and try all of it. Like, yeah, I... Um, Let's, let's put it this way. Let me be a bit more serious about the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like um, I, I really try to encourage also my team members to explore and try different things. And it's also team set up. It's also, you know, do you work for a product house, you know, for like a big tech company, for a small startup, um, famous agency, um, unknown agency. Like it's all so different. Um, sometimes you just take... Take, you know, take your chances. And if you go for an unknown brand and that brand really grows and you, you, you win, you know, you, you kind of grow really fast and you get to experience that. And sometimes you actually learn more being like a, uh, one of, of 300 designers because there's like this huge community behind you. So yeah, I think you should just try all of them mm. and find what fits you. And we all, again, we have... It's, it's, it's a long life, you know, we have uh, many years of being in our profession, so you have the time to try it all. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my uh, only smart thing I have to say about it. <laughs> I like yeah. that a lot. Yeah. Take, take all the experience with you and then maybe you'll end up opening a restaurant in, yeah, the, in, in the end <laughs> in years. and that's it. Cool, <laughs> Forget man. about your Yeah, Thank you so much for coming on, Jonathan. Thank you. This has been thank a real you. blast. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. Cool. And then I'm going to round it off here. I'm going to put all Jonathan's socials below the like button. So check that out. And with that being said, thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next one.